So I'm, I'm just going to um, tell a little bit about each of these people and let them talk for themselves. So um, I, th I think... I think the thing that I think the thing that bothers me the most about what's going on in our prisons and in our state and in our nation is the way people are misunderstood that we have locked up in the prisons. So in in and I'll just tell you a quick story and then I'll shut up. But in 2006, a woman applied to our program. Uh, her ne name was Becky Hopwood, and uh, she had she was a middle-aged nurse in Walla Walla, and probably had never had a parking ticket in her life. But she was kidnapped and taken to Ken Kennewick and locked up in a house and repeatedly raped over the course of a weekend. And out of that, she became a friend came over from the hospital later and introduced her to mess so she could quote unquote be happy again, right? Because she had, the trauma of what happened had crashed her into a, a, a deep depression. So, so she ended up taking a leave of absence from the general hospital and uh, eventually, because you can't practice, do well as a, as a registered nurse in an emergency room setting if you're on drugs, she lost her job. Then she didn't have the income to pay for uh, to pay for the drugs that she was addicted to. And so she started manufacturing and dealing and then she ended up being arrested and was sentenced to prison for seven years. The guy who kidnapped and raped her was sentenced to two years. And, um, but the, the point I wanna make is that not one word in the Walla Walla Union Bulletin or any other media about the kidnap and the rape it was just about the dealing and the manufacturing. And so, um, and, and, that, and that's what happens. We, we in the public never know the stories unless like Joe's been to prison with us a lot of times, Mike McCormick's been to prison with us a lot of times, a student of ours over here uh, was a prisoner. Um, you never see the background story, you don't see, uh, the four-year-old you don't see the four-year-old girl little girl who watches her dad be hauled off to prison for a life sentence and, and be traumatized from that you don't see the six-year-old kid who's introduced to drugs by her parents you don't see the ten-year-old young man who's introduced to drugs by his dad um, you just see half truths and, and distortions and lies in the media. So, uh, hopefully, some of what I mean you'll learn tonight is is the background stories. And what's really cool is um, the way Shalisha and Jenny and Keith uh, have have risen above what happened to them earlier and continue to rise. So I'm gonna go to the back. So stop smiling. <laughs> Who wants to go first? Thanks for being here. So keep white on everybody. <laughs> yeah, talk loud. I don't think the mic's it's working. working. Yeah, it's not. It's, I don't think it's projecting outwards. It's just recording. Audio. The mic oh. is for okay. video, so we just oh. need to project. Okay. Oh, okay. Can everyone hear me all right? Absolutely. Okay. Then you can come forward a little bit, Keith, too. So I'll do my... Don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm so... Prison. Oh. <laughs> Got me. No, so, um, so my name's Keith Whiteman. Um, I'm a, a dedicated family member today. Um, I'm a graduate of Evergreen State College and the post-prison education program, and, um, and I love my life today. Um, I think I was about five years old when I first remember meeting my father, my biological father. Is anybody familiar with the Goldfish Tavern? 
A bit point defiance? Yeah. Well, if you can remember, well, I'm 43, so five. That was a, this was when the goldfish had a line of Harley Davidsons out front, right? Yeah. And that was the kind of place that the goldfish was. And um, I just remember being down on the hill with my mom and my brother and my sister and my dad and my mom and my mom telling us, do you want to meet your dad? And of course, I was, you know, ecstatic to be able to meet my father. I had no father in my life. All I knew was my mother. Um, she pointed up the hill and said, he's up there. And me and my brother took off running and we met my dad. The first time I met my father, Harley Davidson's leather jackets. And this was my first vision of what it meant to be uh, a man, right? What it meant to be, this was my male role model for the first time, right? Drinking alcohol, riding a Harley, wearing leather, and, and that's what it was, right? And this, and this vision was ingrained in my mind of what cool meant. What it was like was uh, the Marlboro Man and Harley Davidson, like combined, right? So as I went through my life, I, I lived up to this expectation of what my father was. And eventually when I started visiting with my father and I was 9, 10, 11 years old and I was spending weekends with my father and I witnessed my dad um, cooking meth in the garage. He had Harley's strewn apart in the living room, uh, people in and out of the house. Um, that's the kind of environment that I grew up in on my father's side. And my mom was a different story. That's the, the half of me, I believe, that saved my life, um, in essence. But so this is where my life went. So I, I began to live my life like I had that vision of my father, right? So at, I think I was probably, it's hard to remember ages. I'm getting kind of old now, so it's really hard. But I think I was about 12 years old when I tried meth for the first time. And... Um, I smoked pot with my father when I was probably 11 and, you know, we played shot games with whiskey at about the same age. And that was kind of, um, that was life. That's why I wanted to go to my dad's every weekend in the summers, right? So that's what I did. And that left a lasting impression on the way that I lived my life for probably the next 12 years until I, until I started getting in trouble with the law, right? Um, he passed away, but I continued his legacy um, and lived my life a certain way, which, you know, I'm, hesit I'm hesitant to continue, like, to come and, like, tell you my stories of trauma because I'm not, I'm sure you can all imagine the traumas that are involved with living a life uh, in that kind of a lifestyle, but needless, needless to say, I, I lived my life like that for a long period of time. <clears throat> And by the time I was 18, um, I caught my first prison sentence, um, which at 18 years old, um, my brain wasn't even processing consequences and repercussions at that point in my life, right? But here I was um, looking at years in prison, which I ended up getting. Um, and I got an education while I was in prison, and I'm not talking about a college education. It taught me how to come out and, and live my life that way and, um, and I continued in that path. I continued over and over um, until one day, I think it was on my fifth prison sentence. Um, yeah, so this is, well, the story's not over. So <laughs> on my fifth prison sentence, I, I, it's so cliche, but uh, I, I found Jesus, right? Jesus found me, right? I found. I found religion. I got some spiritual, uh, well, I found, I had, I had a come to Jesus moment, right? And, um, and I got really involved in the church at Monroe Correction Center. And uh, we had an inmate ran service where there was an a inmate pastor, ushers. Like I served coffee for the first three months to the guys that were coming through. And, and, uh, and I'd been praying and praying and praying. And then one day, Moses walks in. <laughs> and Eldon Vale, I think. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and Eldon Vale and, uh, uh, and Kimberly Mays. And 
I listened through the whole, the whole dog and pony show is what we, we ended up calling it after I've done like a dozen of them myself now as a dog and pony show. We just come in and we spill our guts. Well, this happened and, uh, and I ran up to Ari and I said, do you know what it feels like to be the answer to a prayer? And he actually stepped back and put Kimberly in front of him. <laughs> but, um, and then me and Kimberly got to talking. And, and all I knew is my, my prayer was that, I, that, that God would put somebody in my life that would help me figure out some other way. Some other, I knew that I wanted another life and I knew I was smart enough. I just didn't know how to do it. And I needed someone to hold my hand, right? So I prayed probably for two months straight. That was my prayer. And then they walk and here I am. And, and I'm like, I get a phone number. And this was before we had a toll free number. And, um, and I'm, car I'm calling Ari's cell phone, you know, every other day, blowing him up. And finally he just said, stop calling, you're in, we got you. We'll figure it out. Just stop calling me, okay? And, and this, is, this is kind of, it's kind of how it works in this program. Like, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. The, peop the people that, you know, that's another story. But, um, so that happened. And, and I got out of prison. And uh, the next morning after I'd gotten out of prison, um, Ari was knocking on my door in person. Um, and it was time to go. He goes, get the car. We got to go. So we go to Pierce College. Um, my financial aid hadn't came through. We worked with people at the school and I got an opportunity grant. Like things just happened. We showed up, we suited up, we showed up and things came together. And I think the next day I was in my first college class at Pierce College and things started looking up. I was getting 3.8s, 4.0s, like I was getting great grades. I was neglecting certain parts of my life and they'd come around and bite me in the rear end every once in a while, you know. Um, and then I'd get a handle on them and, and then I'd kind of uh, get complacent again. And I went through this process where I didn't take my addictions and, and, and my issues seriously enough. And they'd come and they'd bite me in the rear end again, right? But through all of that, through two treatment centers, um, and, and quite a bit of trouble, the program was always there, like, with unconditional positive regard. And that's what this program's all about. It's about people who've been through the same thing that I was going through then, they've been through it, right? And that's where we gain our strength, is we work with people who've also dealt with the same traumas and the same life issues that, that I dealt with, right? And, and it's, of course it's on other levels, but that's not the end of the story, right? Um, I still didn't get it together. It happened again, okay? So um, I went back to prison even after all of this, right? But seeds were planted. I went to, back to prison for a 10 year piece, right? And I got this special sentencing agreement where it was a drug offender sentencing alternative and I ended up having to serve about three and a half years. But while I was incarcerated, all the seeds that were planted by post-prison education program and Moses back there started to grow. When I touched down into the county jail again, I had finally had the knowledge that I'd gained through education, right? Sociology, psychology, to process my own emotions and my own behavior and understand that the wreckage that I had created um, in my using that I suffered enough pain, internal pain, that it became a catalyst for change, right? With, without the help of post-prison education program, I wouldn't have been able to gain those tools. No one was gonna come knock on my door and say, it's time, let's go to school, let's, go, let's get you enrolled. And Well, so while I was incarcerated, um, on that next sentence, the sixth one, um, I was able to get my associate's degree get certification in auto body um, and, and I kept with I programmed steadily the whole three and a half years that I was incarcerated and I came out and when I came out post prison was there for me still and instead of being uh, 
I was still a student, but I was able to, through work study and through, um, well, you know, being a, a, paid a paid employee for a certain amount of time, I was able to work for the program for two years, uh, being a mentor and working in student services and doing the work that had been done for me before that. And this is a key thing, and I say it over and over, is the people who stay around the office, the people who come back and continue to work with other people coming out of prison and getting them into school, are the people who succeed because their life is just centered around education and centered around recovery and centered around uh, success. So um, after that two years time, I was able to uh, transfer from Pierce College and I actually got my um, certificate in social service mental health and then I went on to Evergreen and got my bachelor's degree. Um, eventually I graduated Evergreen and uh, I got a job with Catholic Community Services and now I am working downtown in Olympia um, in this new program that Catholic Community Services started called Familiar Faces that works with the 25 highest utilizers of the emergency services down in the Olympia area where Tent City is and, and all of that stuff. So it's a pretty intense job and I find myself doing the exact same thing that I did at Post Prison Education and it's a brand new program so I can kind of, I can, I, I have the flexibility to do what I did at Post Prison but with this population. So I'm able to, um, I have, uh, we've gotten churches involved downtown Olympia so like, uh, the, the, basically what I'm saying is the skills that I learned being a, a mentor at Post Prison Education Program, I've taken them into the field with me and I've been successful, you know. Um, it's been great. Like. The news followed me around and they were like, it was kind of a cool thing, like what's happening down there. But, um, and I don't, I don't think, because my story, the first part of it is not, it's not uncommon, right? It's, it's, it's basically of the, it's basically the story of 90% of the people that go to prison is, um, the environment that they were raised around and the influence that that had upon them in later life. So that's basically my story and that's it. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so that's kind of a big deal too. That's kind of like the, uh, the so the program is technically Catholic Community Services, but, um, and Ari loves this. Ari, Ari loves that I work with Olympia Police Department. Um, but uh, he wants his junior deputy badge too, but he's gotta do the work first. Um, so it's a collaboration between um, the Olympia Police Department and Catholic Community Services. So on a daily basis, um, I communicate with uh, downtown walking patrol, which is like six officers, um, the jail staff. I'm, I'm able to go into Thurston County Jail, um, Olympia City Jail, Lewis County Jail, uh, Nisqually, like all these jails. I get to go in there because in, es in essence, like um, the population that I work with, um, at any given moment, I'm bound to have three or four people that are in one of those jails. So now I could go into those jails almost at will when I, whenever my people end up in there um, and sit down and have a contact visit with them. Like I'm trusted enough in my life today to uh, go into a, you know, a prison and actually have contact visits with, with the people that I'm working with. And, and oftentimes I just go in there and listen because that's probably... 75% of what's needed is just support in these things. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so my name is Shalisha. Um, I'm 32 years old. I am a student of post-prison education program and also an employee. Um, I am a mother to a 17-year-old son. I am a sister to three brothers, um, one who's struggling with mental health issues now. Um, I am a daughter, a friend, um, and 
I tell you this because I'm those things because of Ari and the post-prison education program. Um, if it wasn't for Ari and the post-prison education program, I wouldn't be any of those things. Um, I wouldn't be the person that I am today sitting in front of you. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my background. Um, growing up, I grew up in addiction uh, my whole life. Uh, I was raised around money, drugs, and gangs, or what I like to call the game. Um, it was something that was normal for my family. Um, my mom was a severe alcoholic and very abusive. And with me being the oldest of four kids, I usually took the abuse um, to stop it from happening to my brothers. Um, around the age of three, my mom got with my stepdad and um, the abuse stopped a little bit because he wouldn't allow it. But then she started her addiction with um, a harder drug. She started doing uh, crack cocaine. And I remember her prostituting um, to get drugs or us being homeless and I don't remember going to being in one school for a whole year. I remember bouncing from school to school to school and taking care of my brothers because there would be nights my mom wouldn't come home. I didn't know where she was at. Um, I remember sitting up for she'd be gone for days calling the hospitals, calling the jails, trying to figure out where my mom was at because I didn't know if she was dead. Um, my stepdad ended up going to prison uh, when I was about eight years old. Um, he went to prison for a couple years for an assault. Um, he stabbed someone that tried to rape my mom. And with my dad being gone, my mom's addiction got worse. But she got introduced to methamphetamines. She started cooking it. She started selling it. She started running around with guns. Um, at that time is when we, me and my brothers kind of got sent off to live with an aunt. And I didn't understand addiction at that time. And I didn't know why my mom didn't want to be with us. And so it was 2000. I remember it was November 2000. Um, I got a phone call that my mom had got arrested. She was being investigated for a murder. And so she sat in the county for a long time. And during that time, I started to get very rebellious. Um, I didn't understand really what was going on. And so I ran away and I turned to the streets for acceptance and approval. Um, I got pregnant at a very young age. I was 15 when I had my son. Um, and so I was, I lived back with my stepdad. Um, I was going to school. I was being a mom the best that I knew how to, but I didn't know how to because I was a kid myself. Um, but we made it and uh, my mom had gotten out of prison and she was doing well and so I decided to move back in with her and I remember she was working and stuff and one night I had found a meth pipe in her pocket and so when she got home I confronted her about it and I have she was abusive but that night it turned so bad that I didn't know if I was gonna live I um, hopped out the window and I called the cops and I remember my mom going to jail and me going to sit, get sent to live with my aunt. And I remember my mom calling from jail, like blaming it on me that she was in jail. And I didn't understand why she couldn't take responsibility for her actions. So she um, got out. I was doing well. I was going to school. Um, I was living with my aunt. I was being a mom. I had my son. She got out. The no contact lift order was lifted and I decided to move back in with my mom. Um, this is around the time I was 18 years old. Um, my mom was heavy into doing meth again and she was always locked in her room all the time. And I didn't understand why she was never out there with us. And so I got introduced to meth by my mom. Um, I started doing meth with my mom at the age of 18. I thought that it would uh, bring us closer and it didn't push us further apart. Um, I started committing crimes at the age of 18 and like Keith, I too went to prison for the first time at the age of 18. Um, while I was in prison, I did get my GED. Uh, I got released. I went to Spokane because I didn't trust myself going to King County. I didn't want to be around all the old people. So I went to <coughs> work release in Spokane, but the day I was released from work release, I went back to Seattle and um, I stayed clean for a couple months maybe um, and started running with old people. Um, I've been to prison five times now. I've given DOC over 11 years of my freedom. 
I learned about post-prison education program in 2011. It was my third prison sentence. Um, I had stumbled across the application. Something had something told me to fill it out, you know. So there was a desire in me to want something different, but I didn't really understand it. So I filled it out, sent it in, but I never followed up. Um, I got out, caught new charges, went back to prison for the fourth time. And it was during my fourth sentence, um, I filled out another application to post-prison education program. And someone that I was in prison with um, had came in and she did a resource fair and she was telling me how post-prison education program was changing her life and all the possibilities that were out there, you know. And so you hear about programs that supposedly help people and programs that are there to support you, but when in reality, like they're not there. Um, and so I didn't know if this was a real program or if this was just something that people talked about. And so during that fourth prison sentence, um, I remember I did go to school in there. Um, I did business technology. I graduated with 4.0. Um, but I remember getting called into the counselor's office and they said, we're gonna make a phone call. And I'm like, okay. And so uh, we call my aunt and my aunt tells me that my mom has passed away. Um, it was at that time, I think I wanted, I knew I needed to do something different. Um, and so as soon as I got to work release, I reached out to Ari and I remember coming down there and it, we had a scholarship committee interview. It was Ari, Keith, and Truth. And I really had no idea what this interview was, you know, but they asked me a bunch of questions and, um, you know, I was just honest with them. And then I started coming to the office every Saturday and I'd sit on the couch and I would get on the laptop and I wouldn't really talk to nobody except for Truth. And Truth was, you know, I learned that Keith was my case manager, but Truth was someone that I confided in, you know. He um, believed in me when I couldn't believe in myself. Um, he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. I remember when I would accomplish something, he would be more proud of me than anybody and send emails to everybody in the office, you know. And so it just, that feeling of having someone believe in you is what I got from Truth at Post Prison Education Program. Um, unfortunately, uh, something happened and truth is no longer here and that triggered emotions of my mom dying that I had I had thought that I dealt with and I did it and so I relapsed uh, I went on the run post prison education never turned their back on me um, I have numerous emails from Ari telling me um, hey what's going on are you okay where are you at like we're trying to help you reel it in you know, and him trying to bring Keith in on the emails. You know, I have emails from both of them just trying to reach out to me before I caught new charges because that's what they didn't want. Me being in my addiction, I wasn't ready to um, deal with it. Um, in my mindset, just I was not going back to prison. Um, I was gonna either go out shooting and end up dead. Um, I didn't wanna spend any more time in prison. And I didn't think that there was a way out, um, but, I was arrested, no shooting involved, no nothing. Um, I did go to prison for two years. And as soon as I was in my cell and was sober, I wrote a letter to Ari. And then as soon as I got to work release, I reached out to him again. And I remember putting in a pass to come see him. And I thought it was just gonna be like me and Ari talking, but Jenny was there and we sat around the table for about two, three hours. And the whole conversation was, how are we gonna keep Shalisha out of prison? Um, Ari asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up, you know? <laughs> and he said, you know, like, there's a list of everything right here at your disposal. What is it you want to be? You know, you can be anything you want to. So at that time, Ari hired me on at the office answering phones because, like he said, the people who stick around the office are the ones that succeed. And I was able to learn everything about working with students, about giving back, about I was able to be that support that I got from the program, you know? And so post-prison education program is important to me because I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for Ari and the people at post-prison education program. I, in my addiction, I lost my identity. Um, I lost who I was, I lost what I liked, I lost everything about me, you know? And so coming out, it was, hard for me to even know what my favorite color was or it was hard for me to know what I liked and what I would put up with and what I wouldn't put up with you know and um, I had very low self-esteem and confidence um, and because of just being in the office and Ari 
having so much faith in what I can do or believing that I can do something or, you know, it just helped build my self-esteem back up and it helped me to move forward. Um, I am registered for school. I start September 23rd at Seattle Central Community College. Um, I'll be going to obtain my bachelor, or my associate's degree in social and human services. Um, I'll be starting with $8,000 in scholarships. Um, and I was able to get these scholarships by seeing people before me, um, like Jenny, uh, going to see her get her scholarship just made it, made me see that it was possible. You know, I hear stories about people getting scholarships, you know, but I've never seen anybody that I personally knew that they achieved that, they got that, you know, and so I thought it was just make believe. And so um, I took the time to sit down and write essays and reach out to people and you know, uh, we went out to the Goodwill Training Center and Ari was there and, you know, it just felt so good to sit there and when I was getting my scholarship and to see Ari and my best friend crying and it just, to see people believe in me and to help lift me up when I was too weak to be, to stand by myself has made a difference in my life. Um, I'm a completely different person than I was when I was out there. You know, um, I'm able to show up and be present in my family's life. I'm able to go up to Harborview every single day after work, even though it breaks my heart, but I'm able to be there for my brother. Um, I'm able to be there for my son. I have a driver's license, a car in my name, insurance. Like that might not be nothing to you guys, but like that's huge for me, you know? And so it's just, um, I'm just grateful for a post-prison education program. If this program didn't exist, I don't know what would happen to a lot of people. I know. Well, don't get too excited. I'm not going to be as impressive as these two. I actually wrote something and I'm going to read it. Typically, I speak extemporaneously. Can everybody hear me in the back? Hi. Um, first, can we get a round of applause for these guys? I mean, they're miracles, right? And I would like to thank Joe and Ari for giving us an opportunity to come here and be of service and to share our experience with all of you. Um, because it's really important for us to know who it is that's in our communities, right? And what can we can do to support the people that are coming into our communities so they can be successful. Because I just want to say that the majority of people that are incarcerated today are getting out. So um, with that being said, my name is Virginia Burton. I'm 46 year old mother of three. Um, I've served three separate terms um, in the Washington Correction Center for Women, a direct result of addiction and my personal life choices. Um, I freed myself from the bondage of, prison, of the prison system, and it hasn't been easy. I also want to add that I did not free myself without help. This kind of stuff is really hard to do on your own. Um, in 2010, I would step out of prison for the last time. My struggle with the criminal justice system did not, did not end there, but my time spent in the Department of Corrections did. It seems like such a simple thing to stop committing crimes that cause a person to go to prison. Even today with my past experience, when I talk to another person that is experiencing addiction and struggles, my first thought is just stop doing what you're doing. But that's easier said than done. It's something that I was unable to accomplish for decades. I'm a believer that we human beings function through patterns. Um, I've been a spectator and a player in my own life for a very long time. Sometimes making choices against my own will, or so it seemed. I paid attention to the things that occurred in my life closely. It took me a long time to realize that I'm doing what I know and have done what I know for so long that it would take an abrupt interruption in my life in order for me to change those patterns. One might think that prison would qualify as an abrupt interruption. However, the life that I was living was far more intimidating than a prison sentence. So prison offered me respite at the time that it occurred. By the time I made it to prison, I was grateful for the time and space between me and the life I was living. I really needed a break from the insanity. I grew up in Tacoma, Washington to two, two addict parents. I watched as our house was raided by detectives in 1976 and my father was hauled off to jail. A few nights later, his crime partner would come into our home and hold a gun to my head, threatening my mother to keep her mouth shut about their dealings. I was four years old at the time. I received little comfort from my mother after he left our home. 
I felt like I was left to sink or swim. But that's what it was like in our house. Kind of like survival of the fittest. I had no idea what I was missing out on in life and how this event would later impact me. I just knew that I needed to be strong and take care of myself right then. Two years later, I would be introduced to drugs by my mother. She was also married to another man who was diagnosed with colon cancer. So she had access to a lot of marijuana. She planned to smoke with us kids when he went uh, into the city to get treatment. I was scared at the thought of using and did not want to participate. I knew my dad went to prison for drugs. However, the pressure for me to join them was really powerful. No one, uh, no one wanted me to tell, so they intimidated me until I chose to join in. My mother was not really a kid person, but decided to have seven of us. I was number three in the lineup and was expected to be much more together than a child my age should have been. It was not, it was not an awesome upbringing. Um, I grew up with the same kind of expectations of myself. I expected myself to be grown up, to be mature, and to make adult decisions. I was an overachiever in school and had a knack for absorbing information. I guess my mom recognized this and decided I could handle more than the average six-year-old. I did not realize what I did to myself by adopting on this mindset until I was in my 40s. As the years went on, my addiction evolved into terrible coping skills. I would endure years of abuse by her, her husbands, and my brother. I was using hard narcotics by the time I was 12 and abandoned my dream of becoming an attorney. I spent most of my time trying to avoid physical abuse by her. She had, a, she had few coping skills and frequently took things out on me. I became more angry as time went on and started acting out in school. I would get locked up for the first time bef right before turning 13. That's when the prison cycle began. By the time I was 15, I knew my fate was to spend time in a prison cell. I was a regular cocaine user at this time and would buy, sell, and use whatever drugs I could get my hands on to escape my reality. I left home for good at the age of 15. At 16, I was raped by a man my mother was buying drugs from. Someone watched him rape me, told someone else, and a group of seven people kidnapped me from a friend's house, handcuffed me, and took me to a place outside of Eatonville, Washington to beat me, cut my hair off, spray paint me, and handcuffed me to the handle of a car while another car drove toward me to punish me for being honest about the rape. I was never the same after that. When I was dropped off at my mother's house, she told me to leave and said that's what I deserved. I never felt so alone in my life. <clears throat> a few short months later, the same group of people dumped accelerant under my grandma's house and set it on fire thinking I was in there. I cannot begin to tell you how many times I sat with my head in my hands and cried wondering why God would play such a nasty trick on me and send me to a place here to send me here to, a play, to such a terrible place. I hated life. I decided there was no God and took my life into my own hands. I attempted suicide for the first time before the age of 17. As the years progressed, my life continued to spiral out of control. I became pregnant at 18 and shortly thereafter, my son's father was shot and killed. I thought I would try to do a better job as a parent than my mother and learned that I was extremely unskilled. I would then marry a man who would beat me regularly and became pregnant and had his child. The more my life unfolded in this way, the more I became detached from myself and dove deeper into my addiction. I discovered a self-hatred that no one could top, therefore I felt I had nothing to lose. I had two children by this time and they had been taken by the state. Nothing was stopping me. I was all in with my addiction. I sought drugs with all costs. I went to prison in 1996 and shortly after, release used again. I was shot in 1997, I saw, shot someone else and was in a high-speed car chase, at, which resulted in breaking my arm. I was on my way back to prison for another five years. This pattern had to be broken. I decided as I started my sentence that I would stop using drugs. I stayed clean at that time for five years and two months. I moved to Seattle after my release and changed my life. The death of my, after the death of my grandmother, I used again. After swearing I would not have another child, I got pregnant again 14 years after my last child. I swore I would not let this one down. I relapsed again in 2008. Going back to, it, to prison in 2009, I hung my, hung my head in shame. It was upon my release that I would meet Ari Cohn. Life didn't immediately improve af after meeting him. I would go through some more struggles with my addiction and abuse before I found myself stable and in recovery. On December 5th of 2012, I was grateful to be arrested for the last time. I made my mind up. I was finished destroying my own life. This last arrest was the interruption in my life that was needed for me to make a lasting change. 
It is because of the support and belief from the people in the post prison education program I was not sent back to prison. Ari saw something in me when we met that I did not see in myself. When I was arrested, I was prepared to return to prison. I called Ari on the phone and let him know I was safe. I told him I would see him in about five more years. It was then that he asked me not to take a deal. For some crazy reason that I had no idea what it was about, he decided that I was worth a fight and paid for a private attorney. Because of the financial support of post-prison education program, I was able to walk out of jail six months later with a drug court sentence. I was so grateful for the love that he and the program showed that I vowed to change my life. That was nearly seven years ago. While I was in jail, I wrote to Ari about the plans that I had to succeed. Once I was released, I made the decision to stay as close to the post-prison education office as I could. I became a very active participant of the program. I chose to volunteer and spend four days a week in the office when I was not in treatment classes. I started to give back to people in prison struggling just like me. I would coach prisoners through things they were going through and in turn save myself from returning to my past. I also joined Narcotics Anonymous and committed to a program by getting a sponsor, working the steps, and going on to sponsor other women in recovery. Since my release, I have stayed on track and worked diligently to achieve the goals that I said that I would. It is because of people funding the post-prison program that I was able to remain free while finding my footing outside of a prison cell. It is because of funders that I have had the opportunity to save my life and go on to be an example in the lives of my children, hopefully prohibiting them from making the same mistakes that I did. After a few, a few years after my release, my life experienced tragedy again. I was the victim of a violent crime inside of my home. I was brutally beaten and left to die on my kitchen floor. I feared the worst. I thought I might not make it through this. I called on Ari and Post Prison, i.e. Keith, to support me through my trials. It was during this time that I realized I needed to return to school. I combated with my experience with service towards others. I started going back inside of prisons while working for an agency helping other people. I began school and I excelled. On December 6, 2019, I will celebrate seven years clean, sober, and thriving. I am raising my youngest child alone and am involved in the lives of my older children. Post Prison was there to support me through the process of my child returning to my care. I have become a mountain climber and have summited the three largest mountains in this, in this state just over this summer, as well as many other peaks and treks that I have achieved. I currently supervise three programs with Catholic Community Services. I'll be starting the University of Washington next month on September 25th, pursuing a degree in political science to try to bring some reform to our current system in hopes that people don't, do not have to be caught in the system as long as I was. I graduated the associate's program with honors and have been recruited by many Ivy League schools, including Yale, Columbia, and Cornell, finally deciding to stay local and attend the U University of Washington. Ari Cohn and the post-prison education program have been beside me through it all. They've provided office time, tutoring, a computer to use, and any support that I have needed to help me to achieve my goals. They have shown up for me through all of my struggles and experience. It is because of this program that I have been set free. I ask you to please consider supporting the post-prison education program. People coming out of prison are coming into your communities. Post-prison provides a new path for people to create new lives. Thank you so much for your time and allowing me to share my story with you. Three of their stories before, and um, every time it takes my breath away for how brave they are. So, questions, ans questions of anybody? Okay, so I'm going to tell you why I'm here and how I got involved. Um, my nephew, Joseph Jensen, Joe Jensen, my namesake, even though they claim it wasn't, but it's the same name, so I don't know what that was about. <laughs> Um, struggled his whole life, lived in Eastern Washington, and was incarcerated three times. These are um, back there, and you're welcome to take them. This is some graphics that Joey did. So this is computer graphics, and he took the word hope, education, opportunity, and those are the only three words that are used on this. 18 years locked up to pay for my mistakes. It's never too late to turn things around. I have paid my debt. I will be, not be held back by the judgment of others. I will prosper have a positive impact on society in which I live. 
Like the phoenix, I will rise from the ashes of my former existence and be reborn. I shall rise above. Joseph Gary Jensen, Post Prison Education Program. So um, Joey did three visits. <laughs> First time he got out, called Aunt Jo. I said, yeah, come on. And he came and lived with me for a year. Um, fell off the wagon with drugs and I didn't understand that people could fall off and like get back on and get straightened out and so we had a no drug policy and he moved on. Wasn't very long before he violated and ended up incarcerated again. Second time, Aunt Jo, I said, yep, come on home. And he was changed. He was hard. He was bitter. He was angry. I had lost him. Um, and he was only there about a month, and he was gone. There was no touching him. And um, so now we go to Walla Walla, and he's in for quite a while. And the letters at first were all about, you know, I didn't have the right attorney, and I've been framed, and all the typical stuff that I had heard many a time. And um, then something started changing, and he started looking at that he had mental health issues, and that he had some responsibility of figuring out how to deal with that. And, he, I guess he met Moses. I always called him Ari, but I'm finding now that the inside term was Moses. Um, and he got his AA while he was incarcerated. And now I'm waiting for that phone call. And meanwhile, my life has sort of been disrupted. My husband's passed away, other family members. And I'm like, but I'm, my door is still open. And he called and he goes, Aunt Jo, I got it. I said, what do you mean you got it? And he said, oh, I've got a scholarship for WSU. I've got housing. I've got it all. Ari's helped me. He's got me in the direction. And I'm, I'm fine. I'll come visit, but I don't need to stay. OK. So um, he made the dean's list. He got hired by WSU for the graphics program. Um, he was giving back to society. I saw Joe have joy for the first time in his life, not because of drugs, not because of any other stimuli, but truly because he was experiencing life. And that's a pretty amazing thing to do. Um, regretfully, Joe's dad had died of ALS and Joe started having symptoms of ALS and he took his life. Um, the good side of that though, is we said goodbye to him. He was full of joy. He was full of knowing what really truthfully life was about. So why am I here? Because I get to experience miracles. And how often do you get to do that? And um, yes, this is a fundraiser. Yes, there is an ask. And if you guys are so inclined, there's paperwork in the back. You can do credit cards. We can do checks. Checks are wonderful because they get 100%. Um, I can't say enough about this program. And I started doing nonprofits. I think I was 24. I'm 70 now. And I keep finding harder ones. I thought the rape was hard, but this is harder. But so at 80, I'm going to go to puppies and kitties, just so you know. <laughs> so Ari, Ari has 10 more years of me, and then I'm done, OK? So any questions or anything I can answer for you? Yes, sir. I've got a question. Okay. This can be directed at any of you or all of you. Is there anything within the prison system that is preparing you for life other than external you know, resources, oh. um, and I understand that maybe things are different with, with the men's prison, with the women's prison, but are they preparing you for everyone that's incarcerated for anything? No, they don't have, so we're supposed to use that when we answer questions. Okay. And, and I'll pass this down. You're also. such a rule follower. <laughs> Well, it's about Mike and the video. Um, so currently, and, and I'll pass this down so everybody can have their own answer, but currently, um, no, there are no programs that are set up by the Department of Corrections or the state of Washington or anywhere else in the country that I'm aware of. I can only speak about the women's prisons in Washington and what I know about the men's, but they don't have programs that are set up to help us be socially responsible once we are released or to help us to be independent. So if you're, you're not diligent and you don't want change in your own life, they follow Foster an environment that promotes recidivism. Anybody else want to answer that? So, Ari, I want to hear that number. So, going through your program, the recidivism rate is what? 7.8. And the normal recidivism rate is what? 33.5%. Does education make a difference? Seems like right. I'm certain it's 
significantly like cheaper. Dollars 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 dollars. I mean, the county drug court programs that they have throughout the state are, significant, the are significantly cheaper. To, to put a person through the drug court program, it costs essentially $60 a day after the participant gives back uh, in the drug court program. and. A, a comparable to what is it, thirty-eight thousand dollars a year it costs to incarcerate somebody in prison. So, I mean, I imagine that education would be as financially beneficial as a drug court program. And I mean, I guess there there are some things. Speak up, Keith. There there are some things that they they have in prison. Um, ma mainly, um, mainly. Uh, Warren Buffett's sister, um, Doris Buffett, uh, had a foundation called uh, Sunshine Sunshine Lady Foundation, and they funded uh, associate's degrees, up to associate degrees, in two prisons in the whole state. And I think there are like 16 prisons in the whole state. Um, and there are sm you know, smaller programs like behavior modification programs and things of the sort. But really what, and Ari will tell you, like the only real blessing that they have made is to allow post-prison to go into the prisons and talk with, you know, prisoners. So, um, you know, some people might say otherwise, but I don't, I've come to a point where I'm, there is no enemies anymore. So it's like, we have to figure out a way to work with whatever's existing, you know? And, and, and I found out that when you pour your heart into something, no matter what it is, if there's some good in it, we'll pull that out and we'll keep that and we'll give you the rest back, right? But it's, it's so few and far between in there. I mean, you could teach someone to mop a floor, to run a buffer, um, to build a tiny house, which are skills, but are they skills that are going to create a living wage for someone coming out of prison and not encourage them to go back? Not so much. Now, is someone going to school, getting an education, um, getting a bachelor's degree, master's degree, and getting into the field, and trade schools as well, you know, and getting into the field at a journeyman level or at a level where they can earn a living wage and create a life for themselves? Um, that's not in there, but... Um, they will, they will encourage you to work in a warehouse if you want to. Yeah. Did any of you ever work for a private industry in prison? Redwood Outdoors? Inside Out? No, I didn't work for Inside Out, but I did work for the Prison Pet Partnership Program, which was a nonprofit awesome. inside of yes. WCCW. So anybody that boards their dogs around here awesome. probably knows. It's a great program. Mm -hmm. She's talking about inside of prisons. Okay. Oh, inside. Do you want to start? We just in prison. I just got talking about inside of prisons. Oh, I see. Okay. <clears throat> so with post <laughs> with post prison education program, um, any education is available. Um, we have a student right now that we just took on that is a student at the Divers Institute. He's going to become an underwater welder. Um, commercial welder. Um, well, there's me too. I'm a student. Yeah, there's Jenny. Um, she's getting ready to go to UW. There's we. I mean, any program that's out there, it doesn't matter where it's at. We'll find it. We'll research. What I do at work is I answer all the phone calls coming in from the prison at our uh, toll-free number, and I research. I'm whoever's locked up I'm their computer they don't have access to a computer I have people call me 10 times a week I have the same person call me five times a day I want to switch schools I want to add this school to my FAFSA I want to look up this program where is their uh, commercial or uh, CDL training at where can I get that so I mean I will look and search and find whatever I can for whoever is looking for it. Um, so basically there's any training programs any school that anywhere in the state anywhere yeah, no yeah. you're good I want to grab it. 
ladies first. <laughs> I <laughs> learn nothing. I'm hard headed, but I I I wanted to kind of expound on the on the idea that um, when post prison goes into the prison system and they have people like us, we come in there. Most most people like I didn't know. I, when I first met Ari, I didn't know that I could go to school and regardless of whether or not I received scholarships, between state needs grant, opportunity grants, and loans, I could actually live a comfortable life. Right? I could, I could be released from prison, I could rent a small place or live in shared housing, whatever it took, have food in the fridge, get my license, have insurance, go to school, you know, that bottom rung on, on Maslow's hierarchy is going to be filled, right? And, and I didn't know that. And a lot of individuals, when we go into prison, they don't know. They're not, they're not aware that they can do these things because they weren't brought up like that. They, they didn't have parents who, um, generally, this is general speaking, of course, but um, they didn't have parents that, that told them that information or that, that even had that information. So it's a blessing that post-prison can go back into the prison system and make people aware of that. So it's just another thing about post-prison. Sorry. That's okay. Sorry. Can I just finish answering or do you want to? So part of it is um, the population that Ari's dealing with isn't the one where the parents are meeting them at the gate and saying, hey, let me help you. Let me show you the way. Um, I've forgiven you. I've been embarrassed by you. I'm, all of these things. It's the population whose parents sort of help them get there. And so that's a difference too. And just being able to help them find scholarships, whether it's trade schools or anything else, to give them the knowledge to do that is huge. And, and that's the research they do. Yes. You know, we, we had, um, the most staff we've ever had was 13 people, and that was before D Doris Buffett became cognitively impaired, and we had her foundation's funding, plus Google is a, is a huge funder for us. And really, uh, and uh, when, when Doris, she's a full-blown dementia now when that happened that we lost 40 percent of our funding so our staff went way down and we're in recovery now but the way the way it works um i'll tell you a quick a, a really quick anecdote that surprised me um so we use the nonprofit version of salesforce to track everything that happens calls from prison meetings with prisoners trips to prisons and the you know in the last month we've been in the women's prison here in town twice and we've been at the washington state penitentiary in walla walla once joe was with me there uh and shalisha and jenny were with us out at purdy um but we um everything we do is tracked in salesforce and um we pull anecdotes researchers pull anecdotes out of the out of the data and and um recently the University of Washington finished um, an audit of our work with 1,746 people. And that's where the 7.87% came from, by the way. Our students are 92% successful. And um, when the state board found out about that, then uh, Brian Walsh, at, who was, he's now with Vera, asked me to, he said, what's the, what's the recidivism rate on each of your levels of service? We have four levels of service. Zero is somebody applies and we do nothing. Uh, level of service one is basic services. We get a complete application from you. We'll do everything we can for you, but we won't spend money. Level of services two and three are you've met with the scholarship committee of three to five people and we've decided to, to spend money. And in some cases, that can be a lot. I mean, we've spent $17,000, uh, $10,000. Uh, I could 
I can tell you the amounts right around the room here, but I won't. And uh, and so so we started trying to figure out for the state board <coughs> what the recidivism rate was for each group instead of for all four overall. And we found out that the recidivism rate for basic for zero, where we did nothing, was half of what the Department of Corrections was. And I was shocked. I was absolutely floored. So we uh, because I thought. Where we do nothing, people would, and this goes to what Keith said a minute ago, well, I thought when we do nothing, people would uh, recidivate, recidivate at the same rate as the DOC. And here it was 17% instead of 33.5. And so I called Mallory Montgomery, uh, who's a PhD microeconomist at Ma Amazon who volunteers with us, and I'm like, what the hell's going on? And she thought I was the biggest country bumpkin dummy on earth for, for not knowing, for not expecting that. And, she, and, and so what it turned out to be was when we go into the prisons and we deliver hope and opportunity, and, it, and it's really not, um, it's really not, white guys in suits who've never been to prison can't tell prisoners diddly. So taking people like Shalisha and Keith and Jenny and God knows how many more over the last 15 years back in and let prisoners see and hear their success stories is remarkable and it's life changing. And so, so the, the biggest thing we do maybe is, is what Keith was just talking about. We go, go into prisons. When we're fully funded, we can, we can put three zip cars full of 10 staff on the road for a week and hit multiple prisons and uh, and, and see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in a week, thousands in a year. Uh, when our funding's down, then that drops off dramatically. And uh, but so, so that's that's the first thing is these quarterly presentations, and then and we follow those up. And this is what we, this is what happened with Joey. Uh, we uh, we met him in a quarterly presentation. Somebody that worked for me was there in. Uh, it, it was a funny story. I took I took Joe into the room where we met Joey in the Washington State Penitentiary in the highest security part of the prison system in the state two months ago, and uh, but we once we connect, then then we come back and see them every month to six weeks one on one, and may, and if we've got thirty five people that stand, sign up to see us and we've got four people on the road doing office hours then we'll just say there's so many hours in a day and we'll and we might see everybody for 17 minutes but we do that every month to six weeks as funding allows and then and that's what enabled when joey came out uh, we had an oxford house prepaid in richland washington um, we had uh, we had paid $5,998. It was the largest single ex expenditure we ever made, and I remember being f floored when I, when I saw it because uh, Dawn didn't even ask me for permission. She just paid it, but that was his tuition for the first semester. And, and, when he, and within two days of him hitting, releasing from Walla Walla, we were down there to buy groceries and, and, and put a cell phone in his hand and take him shopping for clothes and... Um, and all of that, and then and then after that, it was um, it's it's so simple, and it's it's why I don't want to get off on a tangent because I'll but um, I'm not going to get off on a tangent. But one of the really frustrating things about all of this is is the, is is people can succeed so easily, uh, and it's such a simple formula. And it's just you meet the legitimate frugal needs at the time they arise. Period. It's it's not complicated. Um, so somebody relapses, like one of my. Um, uh, this is a Keith Whiteman story. So like I'm, I'm out and. Sorry. Be careful. Be careful. I'll tell a Jenny Bromley lawyer. <laughs> but but uh, I was out in North Seattle, headed somewhere in the middle of the business day, and my cell phone rings. And one of the important things we do is trust build. Because if we don't build trust with the people that we're serving, they're not going to call us when trouble arises. You know, they'll duck, hide, and run is what I call it. So my cell phone rings, 
and it's Keith. And he'd been at Pierce College and he had been straight A's and was doing extremely well. Uh, and and uh, he said, he, I'll keep this clean. He, he, he said, I effed up. And I didn't want to hear that. So I'm like, I'm like, oh, what, you made a B instead of an A? And he's, he's like, no, I, I relapsed. So I didn't go back to the office. I just went to Tacoma. Um, and we spent two days getting him into treatment. And at the time we were able to pay for it, it was $5,000 for three weeks. So, so it's relapse, react to it. Psychotic break, deal with it. Rent, pay it. If somebody's hungry, buy groceries. Um, so that's it, just meet the legitimate frugal needs. So once we've connected and, and got them on track, or, or worked with them for them to find out what they want to do and then just try to facilitate that every way you can, then it's just meet the legitimate frugal needs at the time they arise. Thanks for asking. I just want to say when he did that, at that moment that he did that for me, that, that was the moment that I realized that I meant something. That, that, was, that was in essence the moment that I felt valuable enough to care about myself enough to make the decision to like trust and move on with my life. Um, that's in essence the key to this program is the mentoring aspect, the trust building. And people caring when they don't have to care. That's the key part, right? It's like, y'all don't know me from, all you know is what you've seen today, like. And in essence, that's, that's what Ari, that's, that's where Ari was when that phone call happened. But Ari didn't go home, he didn't go to the office, he shot to Tacoma to pick me up and we figured out how to get me into treatment. And I felt that I was worth something. That's, that's really the essence of what this program is all about, to me. Yeah. Well, I, I just I just want to parrot that. That's yeah. the same experience that happened for me. I, I spent a majority of my life feeling fairly worthless, and um, and by the time I was incarcerated the last time, um, looking at my fourth prison sentence, uh, I honestly like was trying ev with everything in me to die, and I was fine with either die or go to prison. It didn't really matter to me at that point. And so when Ari showed up. When post-prison education program showed up in my life and asked me not to take a deal and put forth the money to uh, secure a private attorney for me, uh, I was blown away. I was baffled. I was like, um, my initial thought is, what does this person want from me? And then I had to look at my life and say, well, I don't have anything. <laughs> so... Uh, I don't know what they could actually expect from me and I'm looking at a prison sentence and you know it kind of kind of threw me off I, I you know I was in a, a terrible marriage at the time and um, the person convinced me that I was pretty much worthless and I you know sort of adopted on that idea after years of living in the same sort of cycle and Ari's presence in my life sort of jolted me it was it was that interruption that was necessary that made me stop and take a look at my life and say maybe there's something worthwhile in me and because he believed in me it gave me the opportunity to stop and believe in myself and so I just you know really want to parrot that and it was super necessary in my life at that time and uh, the love and support that I've received from post prison through mentoring through peer support through guidance through Ari and I have I've been one of the people that he, we've battled. We've battled in front of people and we've, we've come out the other side. And because of that, my life is a success and that's what the program does. That's okay, other questions? Yes. Yes, you may make a statement. This woman has spent a lot of time incarcerated. <laughs> she has worked in the women's prison system for a lot of years. 42 years. <laughs> 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 
Elton Bell was my favorite guy. <laughs> my favorite director. I spent 42 years, 42 years in three state women's prisons. All women, except for two years I had been. And it was a medium security, so that was okay. But for, 40, 42 years with wonderful women who, as I was a counselor and a warden, I was an officer. <laughs> Officers, there were some bad ones, yeah, bad can't. ones, especially at Purdy. They can't help themselves. <laughs> I worked at Purdy, I worked at Mission Creek, I worked in Nebraska, Nevada, and Washington State. I want to tell you that we had programs, I worked on programs that helped you all for 42 years. But this program is the, the elite of what is needed. Further education is what is needed. And uh, occupational uh, education is great, greatly needed. The, <coughs> the program at Purdy, which is... Uh, no, no, the construction program. Oh, track. Track, thank you, track. Was a, is a great program, it's still going on? Yeah. yeah. I retired three years ago. I've stayed out of it. I wasn't ready to go back. But I'm ready to go back now, if Joe will have me oh. as a mentor. No, it's Ari. Ari, yes, if Ari we, will help yes, me qualify with Ari. as a mentor. <laughs> that would be great, that would be great. But it's a great program. There's so many times I've sent women out of prison, taken them to the front door, and said, there's nobody to greet you. I've had to put them on a bus. Put them on a bus. And there was nothing there for them. <clears throat> I did everything I could. Oxford House, after work release, of course. All these steps that we tried to do. But unless they had some support group there, it didn't work. And most, as Joe said, the family's not there. They need a support group. And you're, you're providing that. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Other questions for the wind down for the evening? They're going to hang around for a while. If you'd like to donate, there's sheets back there, or you can take them home with you. And um, again, Pons, thank you so much for this lovely facility. So appreciate your generosity. Thank you.